Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all. I am Zeba Ashraf, speech language therapist and audiologist at Indus Hospital and Health Network. I welcome you all in today's scientific session on behalf of Indus Hospital and Health Network. In today's session, we will be discussing cases of post cochlear implant habilitation. Starting the session in the name of Allah, who is the most beneficent and the most merciful? Ms. Anam Madhani has been a practicing speech-language therapist since 2013. She has been graduated from Ziauddin University, where she completed her bachelor's degree, and from Karachi University, from where she completed her master's in audiology and speech pathology. She began her career by working in Lahore Children's Center in Lahore. Currently, she works at Indus Hospital and Health Network as full-time speech-language therapist and visiting faculty at Ziauddin University and Karachi University. Ms. Anam is also a prompt trained and Hanan ITTT certified SLT, holding further international certifications in oral placement therapy, picture exchange communication system, and fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Her area of expertise includes working with children and adults presenting with hearing impairment, stammering, speed sound disorders, voice disorders, language delays, autism spectrum disorders, cleft lip and palate, and adult dysphagia and stroke. I would like to invite Ms. Anam Madhani to please give an overview on Indus Hospital and Health Network Cochlear Implant Program. Over to you, Ms. Anam. And uh, today we are going to discuss about Indus Hospital and Health Network's Cochlear Implant Program. It's going to be an overview of what we do at the Indus Hospital. So let's start off with first our team. Our team has all of these people, amazing experts with us. Um, Dr. Asif Ali Ryan is our um, head of the department, as well as he is the ENT surgeon who does the cochlear implant surgery. Dr. Anjum Naveed is a senior ENT consultant. Dr. Shakil, Dr. Aga, these are all the ENT people we have. They are the expert in their field. Mr. Irfan Nasir is our clinical coordinator who actually looks after all the cochlear implant related queries or appointments or patient queries. Then we have uh, at the uh, last row, these are the speech and language therapists and psychologists and audiologists that we have on board with us. So um, the cochlear implant program, basically uh, the core objectives of co cochlear implant program of the Indus Hospital is to provide amplification to those who are in need. So uh, we are catering to profound hearing loss right now. Um, we also tend, we also, uh, our, our objective is also to nurture and preserve lifelong dedicated relationship with the CI patients. So it's not just about the rehabilitation, but the emotional component also, we are dealing with that as well. Uh, we are actually looking at that if the child is getting an implant, the child should be going to a mainstream school. So that is also one of the objective of our cochlear implant program. We offer psychosocial support to families and to kids uh, or recipients of cochlear implant themselves. Uh, we have a community, like we have um, started a support group of patients uh, with cochlear implants and also their families so that they can discuss their struggles with each other and they can come up with, you know, um, Jitna wo log ke hain, they will be able to get the idea ki kitna problem hua hai, kisko kis se handle karna hai. So um, that support group is also working in. And as it, it, the last goal is to expand the program into different, you know, uh, cities. Right now we are just working at Karachi, but we are um, planning to extend it to other country, other cities as well of uh, Pakistan. So that is one of the objectives that is going gonna happen, inshallah, in future. Um, so how a patient is uh, included in our cochlear implant program and how a patient is excluded in our cochlear implant program. Um, so see, uh, over here, we are catering to younger kids. Uh, this criteria that is written over here is about prelingual patients who have been diagnosed with hearing loss before the acquisition of language. So uh, within that case, um, the inclusion criteria is that the child should be below four years of age. 
that is mainly because of the critical period and the critical age. We all know that the earlier the implant is done, the better the outcomes are. And we are looking at outcomes right now. So um, four years below is the current, current uh, inclusion criteria that we have. Then we are looking at bilateral profound sensory renal hearing loss. We are not catering to moderate to sense, uh, severe right now. Uh, our goal is currently at bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss. Then uh, we prefer the child or the family to be resident of Karachi. Uh, the reason is that we give them three years of post cochlear implant rehabilitation be it speech therapy, be it audiological perspective, be it a psychological perspective. And um, without a speech and language therapy and audiological intervention, uh, the child won't be able to gain benefit from cochlear implantation. It's not that, that they have put the implant on their um, ear and you know the child is listening, the child will start talking. We need to give them support. So um, to bridge the gap between the you know, speech and language delay that the child have, speech and language therapy is, is important part. And that is why uh, we need the child to be coming to us every week. So if the child has to come to us every week, and if they are not staying in Karachi, it will be difficult for them to commute and, you know, uh, to be regular in the sessions. And that indirectly affects and impacts the child's progress. So we prefer them to be the resident of Karachi or if not, then at least stay in Karachi for at least a year so that the rehabilitation process is started and we can train the parents accordingly. The exclusion criteria is that the child, if the child is four years above, we are not doing the implant right now. That is again, I'm saying about the prelingual cases. Then we have, um, we don't take the unilateral profound sense neural hearing loss cases. We are not catering to moderate to severe, as I told earlier. And then uh, we cannot, those who cannot stay for rehabilitation services in the city, we are not catering to them right now. So those who are coming from maybe KPK or maybe from Punjab area, and if they are saying that we cannot stay here for at least a year, then we, are, we apologize to them and we are not catering to them right now. Our goal is to inshallah expand it, but right now, we are not taking them in. And also, lastly, that um, we are not uh, doing the implants of those who have comorbidities. So those with autism spectrum disorder or Down syndrome or uh, um, intellectual uh, disability, we are not doing cochlear implants of these population. The reason is that um, right now we don't have all the services available here like occupational therapy or um, sensory integration therapy at Indus. So because we are with you know limited services here, so right now not catering to comorbidities, but yes, at times this happens that um, we have um, done the implant, but later on we get that the child has some kind of intellectual defici deficit or some kind of intellectual disability then definitely we cannot do anything because the implant has been done, but we try to support them as much as we can. Uh, that is why we have brought in psychologists on board with us recently. And th that psychologist basically does the assessment pre-implant so that we know if there is a risk of autism or any risk for comorbidities so that we cannot go ahead with that child right now. But inshallah, later on, we will be doing it once we have all the services on board with us. So uh, the key activities right now, what we have done with the cochlear implant program is that there are regular ongoing board meetings in which we decide with the surgeon, with the pediatrician, with the audiologist, with the speech therapist, with the psychologist, that which case to be put forward and which case has to go backwards. Um, and then uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria and the policies are made within these uh, board meetings. We have started our BERA testing over here at the Indus Hospital recently. Uh, BERA stands for Brainstem Evoke Response Audiometry. I'm sure you all know that. Um, instead of that, we also um, are identifying off-campus sites where we can provide 
services and expand our services. We are trying to give teletherapy solutions to those who are not um, living in Karachi and have done their one year of post cochlear implant rehabilitation with us on a regular basis. We are trying to give them teletherapy as well. It's not um, fully established, but we are initiating that for sure. The local collaborations that we have are with Zaudin University. The students are coming in from there and we are doing the supervision of them. They are doing the clinical placement. They are completing their hours with us. We are training them. So yes, uh, Zaudin University is one of um, the institute that, are, that is with us right now. Uh, we have also been collaboration with uh, private clinics for hearing aids because we don't dispense hearing aids at, at the Indus Hospital. So we have um, spoken to some of the hearing aids dispensers so that they can provide as much concession to our patients as possible. Uh, and other than that, we have Oriental Sales Corporation and Cochlear team as well who is supporting us uh, in training us, um, giving us online trainings and uh, um, about you know, cochlear implant rehabilitation or about audiological intervention. So they are very much supporting us. So thank you so much for Cochlear and Oriental Sales Corporation. Um, other than that, so we have a repair and replacement policy for CI accessories. Cochlear implant accessories are very delicate. So we have those policies with us in which the patient has to actually take care of what we are giving to them. It's not that, that you know, uh, because at times people think that it's for free and uh, because it's for free, they don't take care of it. So we make sure that they do take care of it. It's not about only getting the implant and then you are done with it. You need to take care of those accessories all the time. So we are there to counsel them. We are guiding them regularly so that they can, you know, take care of those accessories and they know the importance of that accessory as well. Um, cochlear implant helpline is something that we have, which is very uh, unique in its way. Um, it is actually uh, working from 8.30 till 5 p.m., Monday to Friday, and Mr. Irfan Nasser is looking at it, our field supervisor, our clinical coordinator. Um, in this uh, helpline, what we do is that patients' complaints or patient queries, if the patient is not feeling well, if the patient has something you know, going on with the implant, something wrong with it, if they cannot come, if they cannot reach, they have to tell us by that helpline. So um, the helpline is very much um, right now working effectively with us and the patients are very much happy with that. We have support groups for cochlear implant parents and um, we are trying to contact schools so that teachers training can be done because we know, we all know that it is very difficult for us and for the parents, mainly for the parents to enroll the child with, who have the cochlear implant, who have received the cochlear implant uh, to get enrolled in a mainstream school. Yes, the, um, the hearing has been corrected because they have, given, they have been given the correct amplification devices, but the schools, unfortunately, over here doesn't get that thing. So we need to train them. We need to train the teachers. We need to train the um, uh, staff how to, you know, what is it exactly? It's nothing about that if the child is wearing a cochlear implant, you consider the child special. He is all he or she is also the part of the mainstream society right now. So this all needs to be communicated. So we are trying to educate the schools as well and train their professionals or teachers or staff members so that they know how to deal with such cases. So we initiated with Advanced Bionic Cochlear Implant Company, and then now we are uh, doing the cochlear companies, cochlear implants. Up till now, we have been, we have done 110 surgeries approximately, uh, out of which 45% are from Advanced Bionic and 55% are from cochlear. Uh, currently, we are just continuing with cochlear. So we are trying to expand that. And uh, this is the data from 2014 till date. The CI surgeries conducted at, uh, conducted at the Indus Hospital or Indus Hospital and Health Network is that when, uh, if we distribute it gender-wise, 
Then uh, the females have been implanted, 57% females have been implanted up till now, and 43% males have been implanted up till now. If you look at these statistics, which is on our right side over here, um, we started off with 2014, as we said, and then we are here now at 2021. Definitely, we see an increase in bar. We are increasing the number of surgeries per year. We are trying to do that. And um, we are trying to actually make it more uh, and inshallah, trying to do it like 100, 50 to 100 implants per year, which um, is going to be big and uh, definitely expanding our services. So right now, only uh, Kurangi campus is the one which is an operational site for cochlear implant habilitation and surgery. Um, we are giving these all services, which includes surgery, ENT assessment, autological assessments, speech and language therapy, support group sessions with parents, telemedicine for CI rehabilitation, and dispensing hearing aids to those who are going to be implanted. So if they, ha if they don't have the hearing aids with them right uh, before the implant process, because we have... Um, um, we have this hearing aid trial uh, thing, which we'll, I'll be talking about later on in this uh, presentation. So we also give hearing aids to those. We are not giving hearing aids to everyone, but specifically to cochlear implant patients who we think that could benefit uh, in the hearing aid trial period. Outreach activities with adjacent hospitals. We haven't started that yet, but we are planning to uh, move ahead with that. We are trying to contact hospitals so our team can go and train them and surgeries can be done with those hospitals. So it has been in the process. This is the map of patients uh, that come to Indus Hospital. What happens when they come? It is just an overview. So when the patient enters, they enter in the filter clinic, also known as family medicine clinic right now. There, the medical officer assesses the patient and then they move the patient to the pathway ahead where the patient has to go. If the patient is uh, not related to us or not related to any of the services at the Indus Hospital, they are referred out and the patient then exits. But if the patient is um, you know, related to um, hearing loss or cochlear implantation, this is specifically to ENT I'm talking about, not to other professionals. So if they feel that he has the patient needs the ENT review, they send the patient to an ENT, then the ENT uh, appointment is set up and then the patient exits. So that's the first visit that happens. Within the first visit, it is not possible for us to uh, you know, uh, do the uh, ENT visit as well as the uh, medical officer visit. So firstly, it's just about the to getting the token, getting the card made, getting the stamp done, getting the check, get, getting checked by the physician and then taking the appointment of whatever service you want to take. Next, when the patient comes, so ENT, because they have been given the ENT uh, appointment in the first visit, in the second visit, they enter the ENT clinic, the ENT checks better test, if the better test has been done. If the better test has not been done, then they said, send the patient to the audiologist so that BERA can be done and other audiological testings can be done. Once BERA is done, patient visits the ENT specialist. The ENT then sends the kid or child to audiologist, to a speech therapist. There, the three-month assessment period is done and then the patient exits. So this is basically the roadmap right now what we are looking at. So Concluding that in one slide, pre-cochlear implant patient schedule is that the patient is seen by an audiologist, ENT consultant, speech therapist, psychologist, neurologist, and pediatrician. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have a neurologist on board with us at the Indus Hospital. So we are sending the kids outside. We are referring them out so that the neurological workup is done before they even go for the CT scan MRI or other testing procedures needed for the cochlear implant surgery. So the first three months of the assessment period that we give, within that, within that assessment period, we actually assess how is the patient's behavior like, how is the family working, are the family members compliant as like with us, are they working 
uh, efficiently? Are they showing efforts that they are going to work after the cochlear implant as well? If the child is a hearing aid user or not, what is the child's aided audiometry like? So aided audiometry is done with the hearing aids. So if the child is a hearing aid user, then only the child will be able to do the aided audiometry. So we make sure that the child is using the hearing aids 12 hours a day. Speech therapy trials are being done. Psychological intervention is being done because a lot of times we have kids or uh, we have parents having some sort of psychological concerns. So we need to cater that as well. The behavior of the child needs to be corrected before we are going for the cochlear implant surgery because if the child is hyperactive, if the child is not wearing hearing aids, if the child is throwing away the hearing aids, if the child is biting the hearing aids, it's not uh, you know, um, feasible for us to go for the cochlear implant because cochlear implant surgery itself and the, and the uh, processor that we put on, on, the, on the ear. Uh, so that is very uh, delicate thing. If the child is throwing that away, the child is you know, chewing that thing, so that is gonna be very difficult to handle later on. So that is why we want the child to be you know, uh, actively using hearing aids and taking care of that. So for that, psychologist plays a very important role with us. A uh, neurologist and then pediatrician review is always needed before we are going ahead with the cochlear implantation. So the first three months is actually the assessment period with all of these professionals. Once the professionals, all the professionals have assessed the child, then we do the board meeting, like I said before. And in that board meeting, we decide whether the child has to go ahead for the cochlear implant surgery or we are holding the child for uh, maybe three, four months, or we are not going for it. So the decision is made at that point in time. Once the decision is made, then the child is selected for the cochlear implant surgery. All the CT scan MRIs are done. Um, then obviously all the testings and all the reports, ENTs go through all the reports. Post cochlear implant schedule is like that. So if the patient first visits the ENT consultant because they need to see if the wound is healed, if the stitches are healed. If that is healed, then they send the patient to an audiologist. Audiologist does the switch on and uh, audiologist also, um, uh, okay, so audiologist also goes in the, um, while the surgery is being done at the, um, uh, at the operation theaters to conduct the auto NRT. And I'm sure Mr. Basum is gonna tell about, about this later on in her presentation. So uh, post cochlear implant ENT consultant checks the wound, sends the patient to an audiologist for switch on purpose. The audiologist does a switch on, then the patient is referred to speech language therapist and psychologist if there is a need. The speech and language therapist does the speech and language habilitation. And the patient is seen by audiologist several times in a year so that mapping can be done. MAP is a procedure in which the sound, sound quality and sound volume is increased as per patient's need. So the future plans for our cochlear implant uh, program uh, are that we want to, we will be inshallah doing the teletherapy on a regular basis. Uh, we always celebrate World Hearing Day and we have been actively participating in that um, day in that program with, uh, in collaboration with World Health Organization. We are also uh, working upon the researches because unfortunately in Pakistan, we don't have much researches available on cochlear implant recipients, on their outcomes. So we are working over that part. Uh, the neonatal hearing screening program has been already established, but we are now trying to take the pool of CI patients from that list and do the um, cochlear implants of patients as early as 12 months. Uh, that is our main goal. The audiological testing facilities available at our um, vicinity and in our in this hospital is that we are doing the OAE screening, ABR screener, Bella diagnostic, proton audiometry, tympanometry, free field testing services for CI patients and hearing aid clients, post cochlear implant switch on MAP and aided audiometry. All of these will be uh, briefly discussed in Mr. Basum's um, presentation. So. 
hold on to it. Talking about pre-assessment cochlear implant, as I said earlier, that we do the three to four months of pre-assessment in cochlear implant uh, process. Uh, the candidates are supposed to wear eight, hearing aids eight to 10 hours at least so that we can see the improvement. Uh, we actually train them uh, to give responses on environmental sounds with the hearing aids on and about link six sounds. Uh, usually we see that the, the children who have uh, profound hearing loss, they don't give us uh, responses on high frequency sounds, which is s and sh. So that is fine. We just need to check that if the child is uh, paying attention to sounds or not. Once the child is ready with the conditioning activity, with the detection activity, we send the child for the aided audiometry. Over there, they do the aided audiometry, unaided audiometry, peach and IT maze is a checklist, which we also conduct. Parental motivation is, is seen within this uh, pre-assessment period. If we see that the parents are non-compliant and if we see that uh, the communication is a barrier, then we really sit with them and we talk to them because this is what we need to happen is that, you know, we should be talking to parents and the parents should be able to communicate with us. The parents should be able to understand what we want to, uh, you know, uh, want them to work on. If the parent is not being able to understand because of the language barriers, then we need to work on it more. If we can have an interpreter or what else can be done, we need to figure that out. Psychological assessment and screening, as I said earlier, to rule out any comorbidities. Post cochlear implant when the child is implanted, First year of life, uh, first year of cochlear implant, actually, um, we give them twice a week speech and language therapy sessions. And those speech and language therapy sessions are individual in nature. The second year of uh, cochlear implant, we still give them twice a week therapy, but this time we give them one individual and one group therapy so that the carryover is started and generalization skills have been started. And the third year of cochlear implant, uh, this is the time that we are uh, planning to discharge the child. Uh, and discontinue the therapy because then we have to cater more patients as well. So usually group therapies are being done with those uh, kids who are in their third year of cochlear implant. Uh, speech and language therapy outcomes are assessed via these three things, IT maze, which is a checklist, speech, which is again a checklist, and intellectual skills of development that is actually um, developed by a cochlear company. So that really helps us making our goals ahead and seeing at what stage the child is at. Uh, it also helps us with the age equivalent thing, like if the child is, for instance, four years of age chronologically, um, and when the, we assess the child, we assess the child in terms of audition, when we are doing the ISD scales, we are checking them in terms of audition or listening, receptive language, expressive language, speech, cognition, social skills. So um, they have this um, you know, uh, age equivalent thing as well. So we can then tell that if the child is four years of age, where exactly his or her audition or receptive language or expressive language is standing on. If it's standing on one year of age, if it's standing off two years of age, we can tell this by this test. How do we uh, schedule our outcome assessment? We do it for one month post switch on, then we do it after three months post switch on, then six months, then one year, and then all, every year we are doing it so that we know that if the child is progressing or not, and if the child is not progressing, then we can work over it and we can talk about it to parents and we can, you know, um, make goals accordingly. These are some of the pictures that our department have done. Uh, this is about the World Hearing Day. We made the child paint the hearing aids. Um, then we went to 3DF Magnificence. We took them there. You can see that the kids are wearing cochlear implants over here, their processors. They had very much fun in this trip. So the vision is actually to establish center of excellence for cochlear implant recipients. This is our objective, like ultimate, ultimate and ultimate goal. And to establish outreach programs and train the professionals so that, you know, it's not with us only. We can, we have to spread the knowledge. So uh, inshallah, we'll be working over this vision and um, we 
been needing all the support, definitely. And um, this is how it is working at the Invest Hospital, the cochlear implant program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Anam, for briefing us the cochlear implant program at Indus Hospital and Health Network. Now I would like to invite our audiologist, Ms. Tabassum Naz, who has done her master's in audiology As and a speech pathology from Karachi University. She has 10 years of working experience. She has her expertise in BERA, PTA, mapping, intra-op NRTs, tympanometry, and also pioneer of new natal hearing screening in Pakistan. She is working at Indus Hospital and Health Network as an audiologist since six years. I would like to invite Mr. Basum to share her thoughts on multidisciplinary team approach in cochlear implant habilitation process. Good Over morning, you, everyone. Ummeed hai aap sab log khairiyat se honge. Mera naam Tabassum Naz. Aur being an audiologist, Indus Hospital se munsalik ho. Gujishta kai saalon se. Aaj ka hamara topic, multidisciplinary team at TIH in cochlear implant program. So role of multidisciplinary team for cochlear implant rehabilitation, uh, we have uh, an audiologist, a speech language therapist, psychologist, and definitely parents. So this is a bunch of experts that are working together. That's why we can have a good improvement in the child's If anyone has a role, is very important. If anyone has a role, अपनी जगह पर proper ना कर रहा हो तो हमारे पास बहुत प्रॉब्लम आता है बच्चे की प्रॉग्रेस देखने में अब हम बात करेंगे इन तमाम के बारे में कि ये क्या-क्या कर रहे हैं सबसे पहले हम बात करेंगे ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट के रोल के बारे में ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट जो है मुंसलिक हो जाता है जब बच्चा पहली बार दुनिया में आंख खोलता है उस वक्त से लेकर और स्टार्ट करते हैं हम उसकी uh, uska test auto acoustic emission jo ke within 2 3 weeks start hota hai but ke foran baad hum 2 se 3 hafte mein is test ko kar lete hain taaki early intervention ho early detection ho aur hum uske upar kaam kar sake to ye 2 se 3 hafte mein conduct kiya jata hai uske baad iska agar bachcha theek hai then uh, we send it home back apne ghar jayega dusra agar nahi hua hai तो हम इसको रीस्क्रीन करते हैं ऑटो एक्यूस्टिक इमिशन ही को आफ्टर 15 डेज अगर इसमें भी बच्चे ने इस टेस्ट को भी बच्चे ने पास नहीं किया इधर हमारे पास सिर्फ दो ही चीजें आती हैं या तो रेफर हुआ है बच्चा या पास हुआ है और ऑटो एक्यूस्टिक इमिशन जो चेक कर रहा होता है 0 टिल 35 डीबी में चेक कर रहा होता है ऑटो एक्यूस्टिक इमिशन बेसिकली क्या होते हैं जो जनरेट हो रहे होते हैं हमारे हम मल कोकलिया में जो चीजें जनरेट हो रही हैं ऑटो एक्यूस्टिक के नाम से हैं और वो चेक हो रही होती हैं कि क्या वो ठीक हैं या नहीं हैं अब अगर 35 डीबी के ऊपर बच्चे ने नहीं किया तो फिर हम इसका ऑडिटरी ब्रेन स्टेम रिस्पांस चेक करते हैं दिस इज आल्सो एन स्क्रीनिंग टेस्ट और 2 मंथ्स ऑफ एज के अंदर हम इसको परफॉर्म करते हैं इन केस फेल ओई और एबीआर बोथ मतलब देयर इज समथिंग रॉन्ग विद हियरिंग अगर अगर बच्चे ने ओई पास नहीं किया था एबीआर पास कर लिया समटाइम्स ऐसा हो जाता है बच्चों का क्राई uh, करने की वजह से बहुत हिलने जुलने की वजह से तो सेकंड रीस्क्रीनिंग ऑटो एक्यूस्टिक इमिशन के पास हो जाती है लेकिन अगर वो नहीं हुआ और ऑडिटरी ब्रेन स्टेम रिस्पांस स्क्रीनिंग टेस्ट जो 35 डीबी तक वो भी चेक करता है अगर वो हमने किया और वो पास हो गया तो अल्हम्दुलिल्लाह योर चाइल्ड इज नॉर्मल आप घर जाएं अगर वो नहीं हुआ तो फिर हमारे लिए थोड़ा सा सोचना होता है कि हां देयर इज समथिंग रॉन्ग उसको हम कंफर्म करने के लिए ब्रेन स्टेम इवोक रिस्पांस ऑडियोमेट्री प्ले करते हैं जो कि 6 महीने की उम्र में हो जाती है 6 महीने की उम्र तक हम बच्चे को डायग्नोस करते हैं कि क्या उसके साथ मसला आ रहा है और जब इसका डायग्नोस्टिक टेस्ट हो जाता है और बच्चा बच्चा जो है डायग्नोस हो जाता है प्रोफाउंड to uh, profound to uh, severe to profound hearing loss ke saath to hum use hearing aid trial jo hai advise karte hain before age of 8 months 8 till 12 months of age bachcha 3 se 4 mahine 5 mahine hearing aid trial ke upar rehta hai aur is dauran jo hai hum proceed karte hain cochlear implant ki team ko proper uh, apne case ko 
और बच्चा जो है कैंडेसी में जाता है कि अब इसका इम्प्लांट होगा साथ साथ जब बच्चा हेरिंग इट यूज करना शुरू कर देता है तो हमारे पास प्योरटोन बच्चे की एज भी तकरीबन आठ से बारह महीने की हो रही है तो हम कंडक्ट करते हैं प्योरटोन ऑडियोमेट्री और टेम्पानोमेट्री प्योरटोन ऑडियोमेट्री हमें बता से हम पता करते हैं कि बच्चा बच्चे की लिसनिंग कितनी है हो रही है नहीं हो रही है बिहेवियर से बेसिकली चेक कर रहे होते हैं बच्चा नहीं रिस्पॉन्स करता हर एक के ऊपर लेकिन बच्चा जब चौंक रहा होता है उसकी बिहेवियर से हम आइडिया करते हैं टेम्पेनोमेट्री हमारे मिडल एयर के फंक्शन को बताती है कि मिडल एयर का हमारा कैसा फंक्शन है फ्लूड तो नहीं है कोई और इश्यू तो नहीं है टेम्पेनिक मेमरेन तो रक्षर नहीं है ये सारी सारी चीजें हम देख कर टेम्पेनोमेट्री और प्योटोन ऑडियोमेट्री करके प्रीलिंग uh, और पोस्ट लिंगवल दोनों केसेस के अंदर डिडक्ट करते हैं और आगे अपना आगे का काम स्टार्ट कर देते हैं अब जो काम हमारा शुरू होता है इंट्राप के अंदर इंट्राप ड्यूरिंग सर्जरी हम इंट्राप करते हैं न्यूरो रिस्पॉन्स टेलीमेट्री जब सर्जन जो है प्लान कर रहे हो जब सर्जन जो है परफॉर्म कर रहे होते हैं अपना सर्जरी को तो ड्यूरिंग सर्जरी ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट चेक करता है न्यूरल रिस्पॉन्सेस को के जितने इलेक्ट्रोड हैं क्या वो सब के सब जो हैं इम्पेडेंस ठीक है और आ, सब के सब ठीक आ रहे हैं सारे के सारे रिस्पॉन्सेस हैं उसके बाद जो काम शुरू होता है वन मंथ लेटर एक महीने के बाद स्विच ऑन का प्रोसेस होता है जब जख्म पूरा का पूरा हील हो चुका होता है जख्म के हील होने के बाद देख हम एक विजिट करवाते हैं ई एन टी का अगर वो गो हेड दे देते हैं फिर हम स्विच ऑन का प्रोसेस स्टार्ट करते हैं स्विच ऑन में बेसिकली स्टिमुलेशन दी जाती है साउंड्स की कि बहुत हाई नहीं होता कि हम बहुत ज्यादा उसको फॉरन हम उसको क्योंकि जो आपका कॉकलेन प्लांट होता है उसके अंदर आपकी हेयरिंग जीरो टू ट्वेंटी डीबी के बिटवीन लानी होती है और ऐसा नहीं है कि हम फॉरन स्विच ऑन करते ही हम आ, बच्चे को इतना स्टिमुलस प्रोवाइड करते हैं अगर ऐसा होता है तो बच्चे उसको आ, संभाल नहीं पाते उस आवाज को समझ नहीं पाते इम्प्लांट लगाने के अंदर जो प्रोसेसर होता है उसके अंदर प्रॉब्लम क्रिएट करते हैं तो हम जस्ट हल्की सी स्टिमुलेशन देते हैं और कंफर्म uh, करते हैं कि बच्चा आ, बच्चे को स्टिमुलेशन गया है उसी वक्त बच्चा हमें रिस्पॉन्स कुछ बच्चे हमें बहुत अच्छा रिस्पॉन्स कर रहे होते हैं क्राई करना शुरू कर देते हैं कुछ जो है कोई रिस्पांस नहीं भी करते एनीवेज हम उनको टू वीक्स के लिए ऐसे ही छोड़ देते हैं स्विच ऑन के बाद स्विच ऑन टू वीक्स तक बच्चा टू वीक्स तक स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट के पास जाता है स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट अपना काम कर रहे होते हैं और फिर वो मैप के लिए आफ्टर टू वीक्स हमारे पास आ जाता है अब मैप में हम बेसिकली क्या कर रहे होते हैं मैप के अंदर हम उस आवाज को जो बच्चा बर्दाश्त कर ले अकॉर्डिंग टू देयर लॉस उसको थोड़ा सा अपग्रेड कर देते हैं सेकंड मैप के अंदर पहले मैप में थोड़ा सा पढ़ाते हैं कि बच्चा टॉलरेट करे आवाज को ऐसा ना हो कि फिर ज्यादा हो रही हो जितना बच्चा टॉलरेट कर रहा होता है उसी वक्त हम चेक करते हैं और स्पीच टैपिस के पास दोबारा भेज देते हैं इसी तरह टू टू वीक्स के मैप के बाद हम वन वन मंथ के मैप पर चले जाते हैं और आफ्टर थ्री मंथ्स हम बच्चे की एडिट करते हैं एडिट टेस्ट से हमें ये पता चल रहा होता है कि बच्चा जो है Uh, कितना उसकी डिटेक्शन कितनी है उसने लिंक्स के ऊपर काम स्टार्ट कर दिया है क्या वो सारे लिंक्स सुन रहा है तो उसके अकॉर्डिंग कंफर्ट लेवल जो उसका होता है उसके अकॉर्डिंग उसकी हम मैपिंग स्टार्ट करते हैं स्टार्ट की हुई होती है उसके हिसाब से हम उसको बढ़ाना शुरू कर देते हैं वो इंक्रीज होती रहती है और स्पीच थेरेपी के हम स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट के हम आ, आ, बात कर रहे होते हैं कि स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट क्या काम किया है और उसके व्यूज हम लेते हैं स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट के कि किन किन साउंड्स के ऊपर लिंग्स में किन किन साउंड के ऊपर बच्चा रिस्पॉन्ड कर रहा है क्या कोई ऐसा लिंग साउंड है जिसके ऊपर बच्चे ने रिस्पॉन्ड नहीं किया लिंग साउंड्स के अंदर हमारे पास आ उ ई के साउंड्स आ जाते हैं तो उसके अकॉर्डिंग जो है हम स्पीच बनाना के ऊपर हम देखते हैं कि बच्चे को कहाँ मैपिंग की नीड है उसी के अकॉर्डिंग मैपिंग हो जाती है जो कि चल रही होती है इम्प्लांट uh, से लेकर एक साल तक अगर नीड होती है दूसरे साल करते हैं और फिर तीसरे साल uh, करके तकरीबन खत्म कर देते हैं लेकिन अगर किसी पेशेंट को नीड है तो हम उसको आगे तक जब तक उसको नीड है जहां तक नीड है अगर कभी भी कंप्लेन करता है पेशेंट 
तो हम उसको पहले एडिट करते हैं एडिट में रिस्पॉन्स चेक करते हैं और उसकी क्वालिटी और वॉल्यूम को चेक करते हैं ये सारी की सारी वॉल्यूम क्वालिटी को चेक करने के बाद हम देखते हैं कि उसने पीटीए में कितना परफॉर्म किया पीटीए बेसिकली हम एडिट कर रहे होते हैं पेशेंट का कि अगर कंप्लेन उसकी कंप्लेन ठीक है तो ठीक है हम उसके उसके वॉल्यूम को उसी हिसाब से एडजस्ट कर देते हैं जो उसका कम्फर्ट लेवल होता है और ये ये काम चलता रहता है एडिट ऑडियोमेट्री Uh, हम इम्प्लान के बाद भी पेशेंट की हर तीन महीने पर बुलाकर वैसे भी चेक करते हैं कि एडिट कैसा आ रहा है क्या है क्या नहीं है और मैप जो है उसके अकॉर्डिंग करके इस चीज को खत्म कर देते हैं तो ये हमारे पास हो जाता है ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट का रोल जब बच्चे ने आंख खोली उस वक्त से लेकर और बच्चे की बच्चे को हेरिंग एड एम्पलीफिकेशन डिवाइस लगी उसके बाद बच्चे को बच्चे का इम्प्लांट हुआ कॉकल इम्प्लांट के बाद उसके अकॉर्डिंग टू हेयरिंग लॉस उसको और उसका जो कंफर्ट लेवल है उसके हिसाब से उसकी मैपिंग्स करके हमने उसको सेट किया बच्चा कॉकली इम्प्लांट के अंदर बच्चा जो है नियर टू नॉर्मल बिल्कुल जीरो डीबी पर स्टार्ट हो जाते हैं उसकी लिसनिंग जीरो टू ट्वेंटी की डीबी के बिटवीन जब हमारा ग्राफ आ जाता है तो हमें मजीद जरूरत नहीं होती बच्चे की आ, करने की और हमारे जो गोल्स हैं हमने वो अचीव कर लिए हैं इसका मतलब है बीइंग एन ऑर्गोलॉजिस्ट अब हम बात करेंगे रोल ऑफ स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट स्पीच एंड लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस्ट हमारे यहाँ का बड़ा मसला पेरेंट्स समझते हैं कि जब बच्चे का इम्प्लांट हो गया तो उसको स्पीच लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस्ट की कोई जरूरत नहीं है बच्चा सुन रहा है बोलना शुरू कर देगा दिस इज अ ट्रीटमेंट नॉट अ मैजिक ये कोई मैजिक नहीं है कि बच्चे को इम्प्लांट लगा और बच्चे ने बोलना शुरू कर दिया देखिए नॉर्मल डेवलपमेंट में भी क्या हो रहा है बच्चा पैदा हुआ सुनते हुए पैदा हुआ एक साल के अंदर छह से दस लफ्ज बोल रहा है अब उसका इम्प्लांट हो रहा है दो साल की उम्र में सपोज तो दो साल का एक गैप आ जाता है बीच में <coughs> सॉरी दो साल का जो गैप आ जाता है तो हम तो स्पीच लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस्ट क्या करता है उन सब चीजों के ऊपर काम करता है उसके इस गैप को कम कर रहा होता है पेरेंट्स को बता रहे होते हमारे यहाँ पेरेंट्स की एक्सपेक्टेशंस ये होती हैं हेरिंग एड लगा बच्चा बोलना शुरू कर दे इम्प्लांट हुआ बच्चा बोलना शुरू कर दे ऐसा नहीं होता है स्पीच लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस्ट बहुत मेहनत करते हैं बहुत काम करते हैं इन बच्चों के साथ सबसे पहले प्री इम्प्लांट के अंदर उनके साथ हेरिंग एड ट्रायल पीरियड के अंदर जो तीन से चार महीने का होता है वो इस्टेब्लिश करते हैं बेस पेशेंट की कि बच्चा बच्चा सुनना शुरू कर दे बच्चा समझना शुरू कर दे बच्चा कुछ रिस्पॉन्स करे जब ये वाला थ्री फोर मंथ्स का टाइम हो जाता है उसके बाद बच्चे का इम्प्लांट हो जाता है इम्प्लांट के बाद वन मंथ उसके जो वूड है उसको हील करने में लग गया उसका स्विच ऑन हो गया स्विच ऑन के बाद फिर स्विच और लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस्ट का रोल स्टार्ट हो जाता है वो फिर से एक बेस जो है पेशेंट की उसको स्टार्ट करना शुरू कर देते हैं इंटरवेंशन uh, करते हैं उसकी कॉकलिन प्लान की और फॉर्मल uh, और इनफॉर्मल uh, और फॉर्मल और इनफॉर्मल जो है नॉलेज उसको जमा करते हैं और ट्रेनिंग uh, स्टार्ट करवा देते हैं लिस्निंग ट्रेनिंग जो कि ए वी टी ऑडिटरी वर्बल थेरेपी के नाम से जानी जाती है और uh, इसके अंदर हमें बार बार आकर स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट मतलब ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट को आकर बताता है कि बच्चे ने कौन कौन सी साउंड्स के ऊपर रिस्पॉन्ड देना शुरू किया नॉक के ऊपर दे रहा है क्लैप के ऊपर दे रहा है लिंक साउंड्स के ऊपर कौन कौन से लिंक साउंड्स के ऊपर दे रहा है ये सारी की सारी चीजें ये जब दोनों का कोऑर्डिनेशन होता है तो उस हिसाब से बेहतर काम होना पेशेंट के साथ शुरू हो जाता है इसके अलावा स्पीच एंड लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस जो है वो uh, पार्टिसिपेट करता है डिस्कशन में कैंडेसी का जो होता है डिटर्मिनेशन ऑफ आउटकम्स और अल्टीमेट गोल्स के ऊपर सुनकर समझकर बोलना है अब बच्चा सुन रहा है समझ रहा है हमारे पास तीन हमारे पास यही तरीका होता है ना पहले सुनो सीखो और फिर बोलो अब बच्चे को सिखाना होता है बच्चे को जब इम्प्लांट लगता है तो उसको सारी सारी के सारे साउंड्स आ रहे हैं बाहर बच्चे के रोने की आवाज भी उसे आ रहा है कोई चल रहा है उसके वॉक की आवाज भी उसे आ रही है कोई और कोई गाड़ी का हॉर्न भी सुनाई दे रहा है तो स्पीच लैंग्वेज थे पहले उसको फोकस करवाता है कि कौन सी वाली आवाज को आपको सुनना है 
ये जो आवाज मैं दे रही हूँ उसको सुनना है बाकी सबको आपको इग्नोर करना है अब नॉर्मल डेवलपमेंट में तो बच्चा ये खुद बखुद खुद बखुद सीख रहा होता है बट इम्प्लांट के बाद ये सारे के सारे स्पीच थेरेपिस जो है ये सारी की सारी चीजें बच्चों को लर्न करवा रहा होता है कि आपको कैसे बोलना है कौन सी आवाजों को सुनना है हर वक्त सारी आवाजों को नहीं सुनना बल्कि जो स्पेसिफिक आवाज जो हम बोल रहे हैं जो टास्क दे रहे हैं उसको सुनो समझो और उसके ऊपर हमें बताओ कि हाँ ये आवाज आ रही है इसके अलावा कैंडेसी के अंदर वो डिस्कशन के अंदर शामिल होता है कि कौन कौन सा थ्री फोर मंथ्स का जो हेरिंग एड का ट्रायल है कौन कौन से पेशेंट्स जो हैं वो बहुत अच्छा वर्क कर रहे हैं पेरेंट्स जो हैं उनमें प्रॉब्लम नहीं है सब चीजें हैं ताकि हम उनको इम्प्लान की तरफ लेकर जा सकें और दूसरे प्रोफेशनल्स के साथ कोऑर्डिनेट करता है ताकि डेवलप कर सके अप्रोप्रिएट कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव ओरल रिहेबिलिटेशन प्लान को साइकोलॉजिस्ट से बात करनी है ऑर्डियोलॉजिस्ट से बात करनी है ई एन टी सर्जन से बात करनी है कभी बच्चे कंप्लेन कर रहे होते हैं कि हमें पेन हो रहा है बिना वजह की चीजें तो उन सब चीजों को स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट हफ्ते में दो बार सेशन ले रहा होता है बच्चा बार बार उनके पास आ रहा होता है और जो ऑलोजिस्ट के पास बच्चा जाएगा जब उसको नीड होगी मैपिंग की जब प्लान होगा लेकिन और जो स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट है वो ट्वाइस अ वीक बच्चे से मिल रहा है तो उसकी चीजों का पता होता है उस हिसाब से वो बच्चों को सब चीजें जो है लेकर चल रहा होता है कि अब ये स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट का रोल होता है अब बच्चे को कहाँ किसके पास भेजना है हमें और किससे कंसल्ट करवाना है स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट ही बच्चे को कंसल्ट करवाता है कि वो साइकोलॉजिस्ट के पास जाएगा या नहीं जाएगा हर बच्चे को नीड नहीं होती कि वो साइकोलॉजिस्ट के पास जाए बिहेवियर मैनेज हो लेकिन जिनको होती है तो वो लेकर चल रहा होता है इसके अलावा स्पीच लैंग्वेज थेरेपिस्ट इंश्योर करवाता है कि वो आठ से दस घंटे जो है अपनी एम्प्लीफिकेशन डिवाइस को पहने जो प्रोसेसर है उसको प्रॉपर तौर पर लगाए इसके अलावा साउंड को वो डिटेक्ट करे और सारी चीजें कर, करता रहे ये हो जा इसके बाद पोस्ट कॉकलेम प्लांट की चीजें आ गई हैं जो अभी हमने आपके साथ डिस्कस की फिर हमारे पास रोल आ जाता है स्पीच थेरेपिस्ट का इस इस सूरत हाल में कि वो मेंटेन करेगा जनरल नॉलेज फॉर सीआई टेक्नोलॉजी कि कौन सा ब्रांड है क्या है कॉम्पोनेंट्स क्या है एसेसरीज कैसे 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 यूज होंगी उनकी सारी की सारी सेटिंग अब हम बात करेंगे रोल ऑफ साइकोलॉजिस्ट के ऊपर प्री इम्प्लान में और पोस्ट इम्प्लान दोनों में नॉलेज असेसमेंट वेरी हेटिक पेशेंट के साथ काम करके ये पता करना कि कोई को मॉर्बिडिटी तो नहीं है कैसा काम कर रहा है कैसा नहीं कर रहा बिहेवियर को कैसे मैनेज कर रहा है ये सब कुछ हमारे पास साइकोलॉजिस्ट कर रहे होते हैं अच्छा अब हमारे यहाँ दो तरह के लोग हैं एक ये कि इम्प्लांट हमने किया इम्प्लांट करना है लेकिन पेरेंट्स जो है डिनाइल फेज में ये वो वाले बच्चे हैं जो हम न्यू बॉर्न हेयरिंग स्क्रीनिंग से उठा रहे हैं पेरेंट्स मानने के लिए तैयार नहीं है कि बच्चा सुन नहीं रहा छह आठ महीने का बच्चा है हम उसको देखते हैं हम बात करते हैं वो हमारे साथ मुस्कुराता है वो मुड़कर देखता है उसकी आवाजें निकलती हैं मुस्कुराने की तो बच्चा ठीक है तो अब साइकोलॉजिस्ट का यहाँ पर रोल होता है कि वो पेरेंट्स को इस चीज के बारे में बताएं मोटिवेट करें इम्प्लांट के बारे में कि क्या काम हो रहा है बच्चे के साथ इसके अलावा जब डिनाइल फेज में पेरेंट्स होते हैं तो एक और चीज हमारे यहाँ आ जाती है कि हम बाबाओं के चक्कर लगाने शुरू कर देते हैं कि नहीं बच्चा नहीं बोल रहा है ना डिलेड स्पीच है दो साल का हो गया ढाई साल का हो गया लेकिन डिलेड स्पीकर है ये थोड़ा देर से बोलेगा तो फला बाबा के पास गए थे फला जगह गए थे ये हुआ था वो हुआ था तो साइकोलॉजिस्ट बेसिकली उन्हें समझा रहा होता है कि देखें अगर आपका एक हाथ या पैर खुदा न खासा किसी वजह से कट जाता है आपने अभी तक दुनिया में नहीं देखा कि वो दोबारा से ग्रो हो सके आज तक देखा नहीं देखा इसी तरीके से कान में हमारे कुछ हेरिंग सेल्स होते हैं जो डैमेज हो जाते हैं वो दोबारा ना रिग्रो होते हैं और ना उनको हम लगाया जा सकता है हम कुछ नहीं कर सकते तो ये वाली की सा, ये वाली सारी की सारी जो काउंसलिंग है ये हमारे पास प्री इम्प्लांट के अंदर साइकोलॉजिस्ट कर रहा होता है फैमिली के इश्यूज बहुत सारे के बच्ची सुन नहीं रही सुन रही है सपोज अगर तीन चार हैं तो देखें क्यों नहीं हो रहा है ये तो आपको अल्लाह ताला की तरफ से जो है कोई सजा दी जा रही है तो उसके अंदर पेरेंट्स जो हैं वो बहुत ज्यादा 
बहुत ज्यादा स्ट्रेस में आ जाते हैं तो उस स्ट्रेस को कम करना एक तो पहले उनको ये यकीन दिलाना कि आपके बच्चे के साथ ये मसला है क्योंकि अगर सामने की कोई भी डिसेबिलिटी होती है हमें नजर आ रही होती है हेरिंग हमारे पास ऐसा मसला है जो बजाहिर नजर नहीं आता जब बच्चा नहीं बोल रहा है दो साल ढाई साल की उम्र में तब हम उसकी तरफ ध्यान देते हैं कि क्यों नहीं बोल रहा और उस वक्त भी हमारे पास सुनने का मसला नहीं आता हम ये नहीं सोचते हैं कि बच्चा सुन नहीं रहा तो बोल नहीं रहा नहीं सुनता सब कुछ बोल नहीं रहा क्योंकि हम इतने आदि हो चुके होते हैं बच्चों को पॉइंटिंग करने के जाओ दरवाजा खोलो चप्पल पहनो जाओ ये करो जाओ वो करो तो पेरेंट्स को ये लगता ही नहीं है <laughs> जब पता चलता है तो वो बहुत स्ट्रेस में आ जाते हैं साइकोलॉजिस्ट इससे पहले ये सारी की सारी चीजें देखता है और उन लोगों की भी काउंसलिंग करता है जिनके साथ कोई को हो इंडस हॉस्पिटल में अभी जिन बच्चों के साथ कोई को मोबिलिटी मसलन ए है ऑटिज्म है कोई भी ऐसी चीज है अभी हम उन बच्चों को कैटर नहीं करें जैसा कि मिसाल हमने आपको बताया था इनशाला इन फ्यूचर वी आर प्लानिंग कि ये सारी की सारी चीजें भी देखी जाएंगी तो उन्हें ये बताना कि देखें हम इम्प्लांट से इतना फायदा नहीं उठा सकते और अभी हमारा ये क्राइटेरिया नहीं है तो हम नहीं करेंगे उन पेरेंट्स को आ, काउंसिल करना और गाइड करना ये सारी की सारी चीजें आ जाती हैं अब चैलेंज यहाँ पर भी आ जाता है कि पेरेंट्स वही वाली बात जैसे मैंने अभी बताया था कि वो मान नहीं रहे होते हैं कि अगर डिवाइस लग गई कुछ भी हो गया तो बच्चा बोलना शुरू कर दे उनको ये सारा का सारा काउंसिल करना और अगर पेरेंट और चाइल्ड की कम्युनिकेशन अच्छी नहीं है जैसा कि हम नॉर्मल हेयरिंग में भी देखते हैं स्पीच लैंग्वेज थेपिस्ट के पास वो केसेज आते हैं कि मदर और फादर दोनों के दोनों वर्किंग है बच्चा घर में अकेला था और बात करना नहीं शुरू की सुन रहा है हेरिंग टेस्ट बिल्कुल ठीक है सब कुछ है लेकिन उसे बात करना शुरू नहीं की क्यों क्योंकि उसको एक्सपोजर नहीं मिला था अब यहाँ पर पेरेंट्स के बताना कि उसको एक्सपोजर भी देना है आपको एक अहम रोल प्ले करना है कि आपको उससे बात करनी है उसको इन्वायरमेंटल साउंड बताने हैं उसको जो स्पीच साउंड है सारी की सारी ये चीजें बतानी है बिहेवियर का कंसर्न आता है कि कभी बहुत अग्रेसिव हो जाते हैं बच्चे ये सारी की सारी चीजें स्ट्रेस और उन सबको कोप करना ये सारी चीजें आ जाती हैं अब सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट रोल पेरेंट्स का बाकी तीनों एक्सपर्ट जिनके बारे में मैंने बात की ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट स्पीच थेरापिस्ट साइकोलॉजिस्ट दे आर एक्सपर्ट बट पेरेंट्स पेरेंट्स को हमें बहुत या केयर गिवर को हमें बहुत बहुत ज्यादा अपने साथ लेकर चलना होता है अगर दे डोंट वर्क बाकी सबका काम बेकार हो जाता है स्पीच थेरापिस्ट के पास बच्चा आएगा ट्वाइस वीक आएगा साइकोलॉजिस्ट के पास नीड होगी आएगा और यूरोजिस्ट के पास जब जब मैपिंग्स करनी होगी तब आएगा अगर पेरेंट अपना रोल प्ले नहीं करते हैं तो हमें आउटकम्स नजर नहीं आते हैं कॉकलेन प्लांट एक आउटकम बेस्ड प्रोग्राम है तो सबसे पहले ये कि पेरेंट्स जो हैं प्री इम्प्लांट के अंदर वो प्रोवाइड करें पेशेंट की केस हिस्ट्री बिल्कुल सही केस हिस्ट्री कि क्या है क्या नहीं है कुछ आ, कुछ पेरेंट्स ऐसा करते हैं कि हमें पहले बताते नहीं है बच्चे को फिट्स पड़ रहे हैं ताकि हम उस चीज का तो पहले इलाज करवाएं हमारी एक पूरी की पूरी टीम है जिसमें आ, आपका पीडियट्रेशन भी इंक्लूड है न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट भी इंक्लूड है ये लोग हैं अगर पेशेंट हमें हिस्ट्री दे तो हम वहाँ न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट के पास भेज देते हैं ताकि अगर अगर कोई भी सीजर डिसऑर्डर है फिर सारे हैं कुछ भी हैं तो उन चीजों को पहले देखने की जरूरत है तो सबसे पहले ये कि पेरेंट्स की तरफ से केस हिस्ट्री अच्छी दी जाए और लॉन्ग टर्म पेरेंट्स को ये बात बताना कि ये जो है आपके लॉन्ग टर्म गोल्स हैं बहुत अरसे तक आपको बच्चे के साथ काम करना है इम्प्लांट होने के बाद आपका काम खत्म नहीं हुआ और बढ़ गया है कंपेटिवली तो उनको मोटिवेट करना और कम्युनिकेशन उनकी के और फॉलोअप ट्रीटमेंट्स उनके देखना कि वो लोग कैसे फॉलोअप के ऊपर आ रहे हैं ये सारी की सारी चीजें अगर पेरेंट इन चीजों को फॉलो नहीं करेंगे तो बहुत मुश्किल हो जाता है बच्चा टेपिस्ट के पास 40, 30 टू 45 फाइव मिनट्स के लिए आ रहा है जबकि पेरेंट्स के पास जो है वो पूरे 24 फोर आवर्स है तो ये सारा का सारा रोल जो है पेरेंट का बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है इस पूरी की पूरी टीम के अंदर और उनके कंप्लाइंस और रिकमेंडेशन जो है उनको उनको सुनना समझना उसके ऊपर बात करना तो ये हमारी पूरी की पूरी मल्टाई डिस्प्लिनरी टीम का रोल आ जाता है 
जो कि जिसमें सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट मैं कहूंगी कि पेरेंट्स का रोल होता है आपके स्पेशलिस्ट आपके साइकोलॉजिस्ट और आपके ऑडियोलॉजिस्ट सब आपके साथ होते हैं तो मैं पेरेंट्स को कहूंगी कि उनके साथ She has done her bachelor's in audiology and speech language therapy from College of Speech Language and Hearing Sciences, Ziaudin University. She has her certification in oral placement therapy, level one and level two. She primarily works with children with cochlear implant and has her expertise in oral rehabilitation. Along with working as a speech therapist, Ms. Khatija also works as an audiologist managing cochlear implant devices. conducting maps and intra op nrts during cochlear implant surgeries her previous work experiences include working at karachi down syndrome program zaudin hospital and the circle she is currently working as a speech language therapist and audiologist at indus hospital and health network over to you khatija oh uh, thank you for the introduction zeba i hope you're all doing well Uh, can you all hear me seba can you hear me yes i am okay before we start off there's a case presentation i would like to um, present there's a case that i will present but before we start off i would like uh, to share a video that we recently shot with our cochlear implant patients uh, these children they are all um, they're all talking they're all uh, using expressive lang- expressive language Uh, using sentences but we made a short video a short glimpse that we the work that we've done and what is the progress that we've seen so i would like to share that video with you all Well, now um, I will be presenting my case. Um, it's a case. It's a cochlear implant case, and it's about this child who is uh, uh, he is six years five months, and his uh, cochlear implant age is two years four months. Two years ago, uh, he was implanted uh, with cochlear implant. Um, his hearing loss was detected at the age of nine months, and he was diagnosed at the age of eighteen months. Uh, he was provided amplification around two years of age, and uh, his primary language is Balochi. Other than that, the language spoken at home uh, is Urdu. So, coming to the prenatal and the birth history, the mother suffered from hypermesis brevidium, 
and sh- uh, she suspects that she had rubella in her fourth month of pregnancy because recently she got to know the symptoms and signs and symptoms of rubella while there was a vaccination uh, campaign going on here uh, for rubella so the mother uh, got to know about the symptoms and then she informed me that she thinks that she had rubella when she was four months pregnant with this child uh, by the by so the 6th uh, the 36th week the child had a very low heart rate so the labor was intru- induced he was born normal via normal delivery there was a late birth cry uh, via neonatal resuscitation and the doctor stated it as a high risk delivery it was a high risk birth his birth rate was low which was 1.9 kg and he was admitted in the nicu for 24 hours at post birth he had diarrhea for 40 days so he used to have an upset the mother was like a, was telling that she, for the next 40 days he could not even hold down milk at all and he was he had severe diarrhea then moving towards his developmental history uh, which seems typical um his his neck holding was by 3 months of age he started sitting at 7 months of age and he started walking at 1.5 years of age what is the main concern was the medical history um very early onwards there were signs and symptoms of absence epilepsy like he used to start in uh, sleep he used to stare into the blank while doing something uh, going blank and then staring uh, all of a sudden and there was uh, they took him to a pediatrician who without conducting an eeg prescribed him with epivol that's a medicine for epilepsy for 1.5 years At the, at the age of 1.5 years, he was given it. He they gave him this medicine for a month, and then what happened was that they have some uh, nursing staff at home, a relative, and he was like, "Why are you giving Epivol? The child clearly does not have any seizures." So the parents, without consulting the doctor or anyone else, they stopped giving them themselves. Then in August 2018, they came to the Indus Hospital for the cochlear implant, and as per our protocol, EEG was conducted and it was normal. But the pediatrician, um, he was referred to the pediatrician because, as per protocol, the pediatrician also uh, con- there's a consultation with the pediatrician as well before the cochlear implant, and he uh, d- through the history taking and his signs and symptoms, he was again given epi- epi- epivol. which was tapered off within one point of five months so pre implant uh, we would say his epilepsy the absence seizures were uh, the were treated he was given um, epivol and he got even better also with the startling in sleep and uh, staring into blank and all those symptoms were uh, decreased largely but what happened was implant was he started uh, developing language as well but after the fourth map which is around uh three or four months uh post switch on uh, there was a behavioral change there were hyperactivity his attention span reduced a large regression in speech and excessive vocalization was seen there were vocalizations but expressive vocabulary was uh, regressed he used to vocalize without any uh, like a u karke he used to vocalize all the time constantly but there was a regression in speech whatever he had learned there was a complete regression so he was referred to dr raman kumar who is a neurology pediatric neurologist here and he diagnosed him with generalized seizure disorder then he was put on medicines again in april 2020 um and it was gradually reduced because the medicine given was of a very high dose and it was keeping him very sleepy in and out all the time um to the level that he was not able to perform daily living activities as well because he was so sleepy and so inactive uh, after april 2020 then again he was given another medicine because uh, this was pretty high high dose was pretty high dose and was keeping him inactive so he was uh, switched to topiro for 7 months and after topiro his eeg was conducted in january 2021 which uh, came out to be normal but he was still continued on this medicine cubital recently the mother stopped giving him like uh, a few months back she stopped giving him uh, giving him cubanol and then she saw a drastic change in his behavior again she again saw that he was getting hyper active a lot a lot of impulsivity and a lot of beha- more behaviors were shown so she started cubanol again i know self medication is not supposed to be done like this but 
considering where they've come from, uh, they're pretty much influenced by other people and their uh, decisions and that medicine and why not to start the medicine, but to start cubanol again. And now the child has, uh, we could see an improved attention span and a better behavior. Moving on to his speech and language, uh, speech, language, and hearing history. Um, he started off, he was able to detect, discriminate, identify environmental sounds and link sounds. He used to vocalize them. He started uh, combining two words for requesting as well. They used uh, both Balochi and Urdu at home. And initially, we did let them use Balochi and Urdu both at home. And he started requesting using Balochi, actually. Uh, he started saying the I the want word, like do word in Balochi, that is they. And he started off with part word naming as well. He was very functional in his daily living. He can, uh, um, he does not need, he, Primarily, he does not need his mother's help in doing everything. Even if he's hungry, he's going to go and make his own sandwich and have it himself. So he's very functional in his daily life. He was discriminating and identifying nominals and action words. Uh, and he was even he even had a vocabulary around 20, 25, uh, 20 words at least. He had a, a expressive language and receptive language vocabulary. Receptive was more, except was, uh, expressive was around 20 words. But after the fourth map, when there were seizures, signs and seizures, symptoms of seizures noted, and his EEG conducted, uh, which revealed generalized seizure disorder, his vocalizations decreased. He was able to discriminate links, but not identify them. Uh, the use of signs and gestures largely increased. Uh, verbal communication skills regressed. And for in his behavior, we saw a lot of hyperactivity. On seat behavior was very limited. Uh, not even for uh, a minute, I would say. It was like 30 seconds, and then he used to just stand up. His attention span declined largely. And uh, he got distracted from the slightest of thing. Even his own shadow on the table used to distract him. He had a fleeting eye contact. And later on, he was also diagnosed while we by the psychologist conducted a uh, psychological assessment. He was also diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, his vocalization decreased to a level that the mother was like, uh, we are uh, we are waiting to listen to his sound voice because we haven't heard it in so long. So the parents were so desperate to even listen to his sound, even if he says ah or even if he sees ooh, they were like hey, they were like at least some sound, some voice, something that we could hear from him. Uh, since there's an implant, but we're still not able to hear him. So that was a regression that was seen from requesting from two words, using two words, and naming nominals to this. So along with the neurological con uh, consultation, there was two approaches that we used. And it was incorporated. We, I won't say that we used AVT completely alone, or as an AVT as a whole, and then PEX as a whole. But we somehow incorporated these two approaches to make him functional in communication. So what is auditory verbal therapy? So auditory verbal therapy is an auditory based uh, teaching approach approach, and it involves uh, family involvement. It's like significant family involvement is needed. It is a basically huge child to learn to listen <coughs> and it uh, stimulates the auditory de brain development. Um, it is in a way that the brain is uh, the auditory cortex in the brain is stimulated to listen and then the then uh, language is uh, taught like the child learns language that way so it's listening and spoken language strategies that are used for auditory verbal therapy and one of some a few i've i mentioned a few of them it could be auditory closure for example this is a and the child is going to be like cat or auditory sandwiching uh, since we do not advocate for lip reading with the child with the cochlear implant we prefer it's a uh, it's something the fo they focus more on the auditory part rather on the visual part so in auditory sandwich uh, we um, say the word to the child and if he's not listening or he's not comprehending it well so after saying it twice we show the lips and we tell them we say it again 
and if C still they are not, if we say it again and then he repeats it, then we cover our lips and then again say the words so that he listens to it. And then through the auditory feedback, he repeats it again. Then there is joint attention and self in parallel talk. Self in parallel talk is something, uh, something that uh, one of the strategies we use with language uh, development and language delay kids as well. So it's like constantly talking with the child or uh, commenting short words used for commenting or very long sentences that the child cannot comprehend, but shorter phrases used or one or two words used labeling, mainly labeling um, things around him. So that comes with the auditory feedback and eventually the child starts to discriminate, identify and then uh, talk. So what is then this is Pex. Pex is a picture exchange communication and uh, it is an augmentative alternative communication technique. It is, they use, in fact, it's visual symbols are used and it's the, the aim is to teach intentional functional communication. So the allow, this allows the users to communicate their wants and needs. Uh, the, ex, okay, so the exchange uh, is in a way that if a child wants something, he picks out the card and he gives it to the mother and in response, uh, the exchange is the reinforce, reinforces the purpose of communication and helps to develop the desire to communicate with others. It is like the child uh, starts to understand that what if I'm communicating through pictures that the person is getting my, what I'm trying to say, like what I'm trying to get, my needs will be fulfilled this way. Often what happens is that if a child's needs are not fulfilled because of a limited language, or because of hearing impairment, we see a lot of behaviors happening. So this also eliminates the behavior because it's reinforced. If he gives a pair of, if he gives a, a pitcher of water he needs, so he gets water in return. So this is uh, like there are a lot of steps in pegs, and you can ask these questions later um, once the slide ends. But this is how it works. But I'll let you know how we incorporated it with this child both PECs and ABD. So we use pictures for communication and visual aid were, visuals were added to anything and everything around. Like the mother put out visuals near the fridge, near outside the washroom, uh, near his shoe cover, everywhere. And whenever he needed something, for example, if he needs water, he's going to go and pick out the visual of the water, uh, the picture of the water and give it to his mom, okay, that he needs water. So the mom is going to keep saying uh, the word a lot of auditory bombardment with pani, pani, kya chahiye pani, and he's going, to, she's going to repeat it often, and then he would eventually vocalize or hum the sound. So he, we started off with humming. He started humming sound, then he started part word vocalizations, and then the mother would give him water. So this is how we established his communications throughout. Even if he wanted uh, food. If it's something that he wants, like if he wants potato and he says alu for it, so he's going to go and pick out the picture of alu because he's really fond of eating potatoes. Um, so he, mother is going, he's going to take out the picture of the potato and give it to the mother. And the mother is going to keep repeating the word alu and eventually he would do a lip round or a vocalization and then the mother would give it to him. So it, this was just reinforcing his communication through visuals. So okay, so now then we start we after the after we did all this, <coughs> sorry, after we started uh, working on him using PEX and AVT both, what we did was uh, we start we assessed the language audition, speech, language, and cognition. Okay, language is both receptive and expressive language using ISD. ISD is an integrated skill of development. Uh, it's it's by cochlear and it is an adaptive uh, word. It's adapted from various language standardized tests such as PLS, Real, ELAP, LAPR, and there are a lot of other tests uh, from which it is adapted. And this is a developmental scale mainly to guide and to focus on the what what is the next goal that we need to focus on the child and what is the age range that the child is lying around. So it is a. In, they have been included to assess in the provision of a program to suit the individual's need of a particular child. So it is from child to child and there's a range that we work on, like it's, this is from 13 to 15 months. So in case the child is, uh, the listening comes under 12 months, so we know what are the next goals that needs to be targeted. 
for example in receptive language we'll be targeting a new word each uh, new words each week so we'll start off with five words every week that we start targeting in receptive language in expressive language you could be using seven words consistently like uh, there's seven things that he needs around in the house and uh, unless and until he does not say those words he's not getting them so we just leave it to seven or a little more if he can uh, use expressive uh, his expressive uh, verbal expressions in so what is current level of <coughs> what is current level of functioning was uh, la in november 2020 we conducted his isd where his listening skills were zero to three months his receptive language was seven to nine months expressive language was four to six months and speech for four to six months from november 2020 to november 2021 we started incorporating this technique where we use both visuals and auditory verbal technique. And then we see this huge, a, a huge uh, jump where he started communicating um, and his ISD score got better. So his listening went up to nine, between 90 to 24 months. His receptive language is uh, between 16 to 18 months. His expressive language is 16 to 18 months and his speech is seven to nine months. We're still working on the speech part because there are a lot of oral motor weaknesses um, and a lot of flaccid uh, muscles, I would say, uh, oral muscles. So we're still working on this. And because he had was already having seizures, so we were a little careful starting off with oral motor exercises. But now that his EEG is normal, so we have, re we have started working um, on the oral motor exercises and the lingual range of, range of motion in a more uh, specific way. So what were the goals achieved during this one year? It was a slow, um, I would say, not really slow, but comparatively to the level he was at before, it was a better progress that I saw. He is able to use vocalizations and now he's exploring his own voice. So, you know, um, tone and prosody, he's taking out a lot of different type of voices and the mother often complains that he does not stay quiet. And I tell the mother that that is a good sign because in because he went um, uh, partially mute before after his uh, e diagnosis. And now because of that, now because of he's getting better, he's exploring his voice, uh, his prosodies and his uh, tones and in a different way. He's using humming, but the humming is not, now we're not reinforcing his humming and we make sure he uses part word naming at least. If it's Pani, he says Pa or E at, um, to get it. If it's Alu, he would just round his lip, but we're going to make sure it's a vocalization also. If it's Alu, me, O, Biho. Then this functional communication has increased. So he knows uh, requesting now. Uh, he, he would greet someone if they enter with a hi, and then, then he would, when he's leaving, he's going to make sure he says bye. He's able to request using vocalizations and single words, but his vocalization right now is in, uh, his requesting right now is in Balochi language. I also uh, um, advise the mother to, uh, to switch to one language because uh, for now, we needed to for him to switch to one language because initially he was given both languages, uh, with the uh, both languages because of the bilingual uh, uh, how, like bilingual lifestyle. But because he was a, having difficulty grasping and getting, he was confused between both the languages. So we moved on over to more Urdu, and um, but his requesting stays still in uh, Balochi because the. Uh, his grandmother uses Balochi a lot at home and she does not understand English uh, Urdu sorry he, she does not understand Urdu so she uses Balochi and sometimes he does not get it so he just moves away from there that whatever they're speaking I don't get it and I don't want to sit around them um, he has the use of gestures and signs have reduced um, his behaviors have improved largely his attention span has increased he's less distracted and less hyperactive now his attention span is increased that we can complete at least two activities before we before he loses his attention or he gets distracted so around 10 minutes seven five i would say seven to ten minutes he can sit in one go and complete his activity so the goals next that i would like i would be targeting would be his uh to Receptive language would be him identifying his body parts, um, body parts and self and others, finding familiar objects in the room. That would be instruction following, simple instruction following, like 
if there's a cup in the room you can ask i can ask him to give me the cup or give me flower or give me pencils so from the familiar object which are those um, nominals those things which are already in his receptive vocab uh, language then uh, identifying clothing items toys and foods could be another uh, goal to be targeted mainly if we get i i would prefer to have targeting categories like animals uh, fruits and maybe transport but starting off with animals and foods first and understanding more simple questions what is this and what is he doing these two questions so that action words could be also targeted and uh, what and who both can be targeted in more simple questions expressive language could be uh, he can ask for more if he needs something more instead of pointing and using gestures he can ask for more uh, he can imitate uh, to imitate the new words he's hearing and uh, combine two words in a short phrase consistently like uh, for example in requesting he can combine two uh, uh, two words in a short phrase like pani to um, or the colors if, if now that he knows colors so it could be red color also he's really good with maths so he has really good um, he's very good with numbers and numericals so he has a good concept of the quantity of things so it could be combining two words in that also like one ball or colors also red ball red car so uh, that is increasing his mlu part and uh, we can work on then i can work on his action words uh, again com- that would be combining two words because action words are already present in his uh, receptive language and same expressed uh, action words can be um, targeted in expressive language so the speech goals would be mainly as i mentioned that he has a lot of or low oral motor uh, low oral muscle uh, tone and there's a lot of drooling and uh, he has trouble chewing food also at times so he has a very specific food taste also since he's been diagnosed with autism right now so we got we now have a more in, we have more insight now and he's been going for occupational therapy also because of his sensory uh, sensory um aversiveness to food and other things so right now we're working on his drilling of bur because lip closure is very limited so we we'll, we we'll work on his lip seal and lip strength with oral motor exercises and for speech we'll be drilling his bur and bur as well and his lingual range of motion is limited because um the because uh, because he had um a very low uh, muscle tone so we'll be working on his protrusion elevation lateralization and retraction and cheek puffs as well okay so that is for now thank you um there will be i'll be open for panel discussion okay so to take it further mm-hmm. we have our honorable guests for panel discussion ms amna siddiqui who is an associate professor and principal at college of speech language and hearing sciences jawdeen university she has been graduated from t n medical college and b by l nair hospital university of bombay india where she completed her bachelor's in audiology and speech therapy and from university of liverpool united kingdom she completed her masters in clinical research she is a phd candidate in speech and hearing at ukm malaysia and our second panelist miss lia m labrador she received her certificates as an auditory verbal therapist in 2003 she has an undergraduate degree in speech pathology at the university of the philippines and received her masters degree at the university of southern california she has more than 20 years of experience working with children and adults who have hearing loss with the last 15 years devoted in advocating auditory verbal practice prior to joining cochlear she has worked at clasp auditory verbal center in manila philippines and has worked as a consultant and as a faculty member in two key universities in the philippines she has conducted numerous workshops for professionals and parents in southeast asia Leah is the habilitation manager for Asia Growth Markets. 
In the sea region, she has been responsible for developing infrastructure, including assisting centers in developing their rehabilitation programs for individuals with hearing loss, as well as establishing teacher training in auditory verbal therapy. She has led the AVT training program at Cochlear Training and Experience Center in Jakarta, an AVT training program under the Thai MOE and MOH. Currently, she is involved in the UKM Professional Certificate course in Auditory Verbal Therapy. She has mentored several SLPs in the region towards their certification in Auditory Verbal Therapy. I welcome you both as our panelists for today, Ms. Amna and Ms. Leah. <clears throat> welcome, Ms. Leah. Uh, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Leah. Good morning. Okay, Miss Leah, I would like to take your insights related to case presented by Miss Khatija. Okay. Uh, first of all, now I would like to commend uh, Khatija for a very comprehensive report on the child. Um, uh, it's it's a very inter interesting case, uh, and I'm glad that it has been uh, well documented. Okay, um, probably my uh, thoughts of this child. No, I mean I'm very happy that uh, they have tried to find ways on how to really address the the needs of this child. Okay, so I know that they've gone from uh, using different methods and actually currently what they're using, I think that is, it's something also that I would recommend. Um, probably one of the things that I would want to have more information is uh, in terms of the listening skills of the child. Um, let's say, because that's one area that I think the, that we can work on because we know the speech and expressive will be really much delayed, but is there a way for us to really uh, build up his comprehension skills? So probably my questions would be, uh, one is like in terms of the linguistic sounds, uh, does he, the child now can identify all of the linguistic sounds at what distance? And in terms of his uh, vocabulary count for a uh, receptive language, may I uh, would want to know how much has he built up? Yeah. For his link sounds, uh, he's able to detect and discriminate, even identify all of them now. And from a one meter plus distance, he can do it. And for his receptive language, uh, which currently are under 20 words, uh, he's able to spontaneously identify 20 words right now. So probably that's one area that I would, because if you want to build that is expressive, the receptive language needs to be much higher. Okay? So you have to, to get, so it should be part of your target. Okay? And uh, I would really suggest a well-balanced uh, categories in terms of vocabulary. Okay, don't focus. You, you want to make sure there's a good balance of uh, nouns and verbs and adjectives because basically these are the uh, three categories uh, initially that the child will develop. Um, if you can look into uh, the Bloom and Lady chart, like if you look at the, those different categories, that's where I will start in identifying the types of words that I will choose. Maybe Thank you, Ms. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Amna, would you like to share your insights related to the case presented by Ms. Khatija? Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, what I wanted to, I actually have very bad internet connection here, but what I want uh, Khatija to uh, tell me a little more about is the AAC that was used. Was an AAC used with this child? Yes, I did uh, incorporate a little bit of pecs, not exactly pecs, but visuals uh, were put up for communication, like he, for exchange and communication. He used to give a picture to the mother 
and the mother used to say the uh, uh, used to say the uh, words like auditory bombardment with the child uh well i would i would suggest that since the child has multiple disabilities and we are in uh, pursuit of trying to establish uh, oral communication uh, a better option would be uh, gestures maybe signs and gestures rather than pecks uh have you considered using gestures with the child or what child you using any gestures altogether he was very fluent with gestures when he could not communicate enough sorry could it hear you he was very fluent with his gestures when he was not able to communicate using verbal expressions could it understand the word of what you said i'm so sorry okay he was very uh, fluent with his gestures and signs when he was not able to uh, use verbal expressions to communicate okay what i what i understand is correctly if i'm wrong is that he was not able to use gestures he was able to use gestures he was he was okay so uh, could could those be elaborated in case there was he, he uh, was not able to express himself uh, orally or was the parents had difficulty explaining to him something or he had difficulty understanding then could they use some form of uh, gestures rather than using pecks so i did not use pecs entirely it was picture in exchange to his verbal um, like whatever he wanted he, he used to give that picture to the mother and the mother used to say the word a multiple times and even if he vocalized it the object was given okay i'm so terribly apologetic khadija i have not been able to understand what you say uh, uh the internet connection is very bad here uh, but i do think that this child uh, has a long way to go the goals are appropriate you should proceed as is and as we have said focus upon nominal and action words uh, for starts because those are the beating carrying words Okay, thank you, Ms. Amna. Okay, Ms. Lia, I have one question for you. A lot of times, it is seen that language is developing better, but speech is not when working solely on auditory verbal therapy. Please comment on this one. Okay, I mean, actually, uh, when we look at uh, speech and language development, okay, it has to develop simultaneously. Okay. Definitely, uh, you have to build up your receptive and expressive language first. For the speech, okay, initially it starts with, it's much lower because speech you're working on just vocalization, okay, uh, trying to formulate, uh, providing those babbling skills, okay. But eventually, okay, so the speech initially will start a bit slow, but because the child has developed very good listening skills eventually the speech will uh, follow it will catch up because now we have to remember the way we say things is dependent on how we hear it okay so if you have developed very good listening skills then eventually the speech will follow but yes uh, the language definitely will go first the development will be much faster the speech is something that has to be uh, that will come, but one of the common things that we've noticed now, okay, once the child begins to imitate, okay, 
this is where the therapist has to decide when do I emphasize on correct production and when do I just allow the child to speak? Okay. Because one thing, uh, let's say those early sounds, if you let it get away, it becomes habituated and it's much harder to correct. So this is one of the reasons why sometimes speech develops much slower or uh, the clarity is not there. Okay. So you have to remember um, children with hearing loss initially, they're just develop developing their listening skill within the first year of cochlear implantation. So there has to be a lot of repetition, a lot of bombard bombardment. Uh, I hope that answered the question. Okay, I want to ask something regarding seizures. In your experience, have you seen patients developing seizures after cochlear implant surgeries? Okay, um, it's not not necessarily. You know, um, there are cases where in kids had uh, previous history, okay, um, of seizures. Okay, eventually um, uh, we got a clearance from the medical people then the child was implanted. So it's not very common, uh, but yes, it can happen, but maybe due to other uh, reasons. So that's why I think the pre-assessment, medical assessment is uh, very uh, important. Just a question, Katija, regarding seizures for this case. Has it already been addressed? I mean, in terms of the, the medical aspect. Yes. His seizures have gotten, uh, his EEG was, the last EEG conducted was normal. He, because he was on medicines for like an year. Yes, yeah. Because this is something that we, we notice. I mean, I, I think not necessarily only on hearing loss now. We know that when a child has seizures, you will definitely have some, we will, you will notice some regression. Yeah, so I think that's one of the medically, something that has to be addressed also. That is the very reason you started. We have kept it as a protocol now, pre-implant uh, EEG evaluation to uh, rule out any seizure activities before cochlear implant. Correct, yeah. And sorry, I have one more uh, point not to want to check. You mentioned that this child has uh, oral motor issues also. So has, have we done, an, uh, is there a separate session just to address uh, this need? No, it's Something we usually say, you know, you cannot put it together with your uh, speech therapy or ABT session. So there has to be some dedicated time to really work on this issue. Um, so he's is been recently addressed. Recently, he was diagnosed with autism, but because uh, he was, uh, he's very smart with numbers and drawings and everything. Uh, the psychologist could not even differentiate if it's autism or if it's his behavior otherwise. So he's already going for occupational therapy because of his sensory aversiveness, because even with feeding and swallowing, he has issues. He just has this particular food uh, range that he takes and uh, a lot of other sensory uh, needs that he needs to fulfill. Like he likes certain textures. So he's already going for OT and the OT was also working with his oral motor uh, muscles. Okay, perfect, yeah. So I think in terms of management now you're doing because you're working as a team, you're attacking it in all areas. So yeah, that's good management. Yeah. Okay. Miss Anam, I would like to ask you one question regarding to your presentation. What yes. is the process of enrollment at Indus Hospital and Health Network? So like I, I said it earlier in my presentation as well, um, uh, we have this family medicine clinic. So first the patient goes there and then uh, once they have got the card made, uh, they are sent to the relevant department by the family physicians available over there. And uh, there we start the process. Okay, so why don't you do a cochlear implant of those who have comorbidities? Um, see, recently, uh, like we don't have, um, we are developing actually, our services are being developed. We don't have an occupational therapist with us. 
we don't have um, a behavior therapist with us like we are just few people right now so considering our uh, expertise right now we don't have um, those services available which are needed for you know those chill for which are needed to those who want like for example if someone is with autism or someone is with down syndrome they need other intervention support as well we don't have those intervention facilities right now in in this hospital that's why we aren't catering to them but uh, we are planning to expand and once we have a big team including the occupational therapist including the physiotherapist including the behavior therapist then we will be doing the implants with of children with comorbid comorbidities Okay, Ms. Khatija, I want to ask you a question from you. What if both the parents are working and they can't make it for therapy sessions? What do you do then? Well, this is a very different, uh, difficult case scenario, I would say. We always prefer the parents' involvement uh, as at the most here. But uh, if this is the case, usually the child is living with someone like a grandparent or a uh, Uh, or an aunt who someone someone's there at home so we would prefer that uh, they keep in on coming for regular sessions and once or twice in a month one of the parents has to be there in the session so they also know what is being done uh, even we have made these uh, notebooks for every child which the child brings in with them and we write down the homework or whatever the works that's been done in the therapy session which helps the parents to be accountable also that what they need to do at home and they remember it that way even the session plans we write it down for them for every week so the next time they come they know what they have done and we can even question them and they can uh, they like there's an accountability check as well like recently i had a child uh, the mother uh, was uh, the mother just had a baby so she couldn't come so the father used to bring her and the mother used to work at home with her and the father used to just bring her here and then go back to her, his office but the fa- there was a notebook that the mother used to send and she used to even write down if the ball the, the child said ball some day she said ball and the other day she said all so the mother used to document everything and send it with the father so the father used to discuss it with me and i used to write it down discuss it and then send it back so that was the way, that is the way that we work uh, with the with these children so because parental involvement and family involvement is very important uh, without that we just cannot i don't think we can uh, make the child progress in any way okay why don't you do cochlear implant after 4 years okay so after 4 years what happens is i there's a critical age period for listening and language and we've been uh, telling this over and over again and often we're told that our criteria is very strict But the thing is, after four years, the brain maturation has the brain has matured so much that uh, making the child listen, like learning to listen, and then la- learning language becomes very difficult. It becomes very challenging, not just for the parents or the child. Even for us, it becomes challenging because uh, after four years, the critical age period is you know it's almost at the borderline right now, and to make the child cover those four years, there's a big gap. of not listening or not having language for 4 years it's difficult but if the child is uh, functioning well on hearing aids and you see that language is developing and there's a high frequency loss mainly but with low frequency the child has uh, working well and his language is also developed and he's turning 4 then maybe it could be a consideration but at large we do not uh, consider um, children be, uh, Uh, after four years. Okay, Miss Amna, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you so much. Okay, I have so one question waiting for you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, a lot of time parents complain that their child is mainly talking in vowels and lacks in consonant production. Why does that happen? Okay, uh, vowels are easier for the child's hearing impairment to uh, decode. and consonants uh, even in children with uh, typically developing speech uh, they do make errors in consonants and so the, it's not that the child is not able to hear the consonants it's just that some consonants which lie in the higher frequencies may be difficult for the child to uh, decode to hear 
even in some positions. For example, in the final consonant position, final word position, consonants such as uh, the S, the Z, or sometimes the C, the D uh, may not be audible to a child. Uh, so the child may say a word by omitting that that consonant in the final position. Uh, also, cluster uh, and and uh, clusters. One of the consonants in the cluster may be spoken by the child and the other. So, uh, uh, actual processes that we see typically helping children's speech, and some of these processes are seen in children with hair loss, and there are some additional. Uh, developmental uh, speech patterns also with, with the hearing impairment, uh, which may show certain errors that the child makes when producing consonants in a word. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Miss Leah, would you like to add in something? Um, okay, so with regards to hearing loss, no, in terms of speech production, and we still follow that developmental order. Okay, so definitely, even with hearing loss, we even go down to non-segmentals. Like, is the child able to produce long, short sounds, high, low? No, all of these are very important uh, important for the development of your uh, rhythmic pattern and intonation. Okay, so that's one thing you have to consider. It's still developmental. So, if the child, let's say, had good access. Okay, so you have to remember speech production is very dependent on hearing. Okay, so if the child has good hearing, even if he was only implanted at age two, you have to think that his hearing age is zero. You're starting from scratch. Okay, so yes, so the speech will develop uh, accordingly. So there's, it's not going to jump. So you have to do it step by step. Okay, Ms. Anam, have you experienced anything like this in your clients? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I have several clients with me who are um, like, but it's very at the early stage, but not at the later stage. Uh, the first six months after switch on, we face this kind of a thing. But again, developmentally, if we see it developmentally, it happens. So uh, I am not that much concerned on that part, but uh, we do uh, then choose certain vocabulary that uh, that basically helps child develop those sounds. So uh, what I do in my practice is that I bring in the bilabial words first. I target them first when I'm working upon the vocabulary building instead of uh, working on the, you know, the the sir and the sure words, I try to do more on the bilabials first, and then I slowly and gradually move forward as the developmental sounds are. Ziba, what I would like to add to this is uh, that within the critical period for speech and language development, at the, at the, the baby is likely to develop uh, the speech sounds, both consonants and vowels, very similarly to typically de developing children. Uh, it is when the implant is given later on, and you had asked this question a while ago, uh, uh, after three years of age, that we see uh, children finding it more difficult to acquire the consonants or making more errors when acquiring consonants. So, uh, Again, it is important to have an intervention, uh, and uh, it's it's important to understand that language speech is to be uh, a impact of the hearing loss. Uh, speech development is like to uh, have a greater impact of the hearing impairment uh, if the amplification is provided later. So uh, uh, there's no cause for concern if the child is initially saying the kind of vowels, because as the hearing uh, matures, as the child develops his hearing, 
uh, uh, skills and auditory discrimination, the child is able to acquire the consonants of the language. Also, I would like to add in something over here that um, agreed with both the panelists, but uh, the parents should just make the make the note of this that a lot of times when the children are talking in vowels only, what they tend to do is that they also speak in vowels. Like parents are copying the um, you know the words that are being said by the children, and uh, like for example, if the child is saying pani for water, so Leah pani is uh, uh, Urdu translation of water. So if the child is saying a e the parents also says ah, e then so I mean this if this is happening then the child will never ever you know uh, acquire consonants so the child will learn consonants only when he will listen to the consonants so the parents should be using the correct pronunciation the correct words in front of the child so that they can learn talking in a correct way okay i have one question for mr basu regarding to your presentation when it's profound hearing loss why wasting time with hearing aids then we make the child hearing aid user for four to five months so that he or she become habitual of wearing hearing device and does not through implant processor and take it as a part of his body. And after implantation, we suggest to use hearing aid in another ear. Because in Pakistan, we are doing unilateral implant, not bilateral. So if in case some happening with processor, you are a little bit aware of the sound. In Pakistan, it happened in pandemic. We, uh, when shipments were blocked between countries, and hearing aids also helped to use child visual hearing to use it. So, uh, we suggest that always use your hearing aid. Uh, uh, and we had uh, the child, three to four months to hearing aid child for child. Okay, what would you suggest how to make my child constant hearing aid user? Hmm, that's a good question, Zipa. Always make sure to attach the egg before the child wake up in the morning um, and remove after the child sleeps so that the child does not get the idea or to remove the egg at any time. So it is very uh, helpful to do when your child is sleeping at the hearing aid. Okay, also, thank we you can so also much, do Mr. the Vassal. scheduling as well of the child. You know, if the child is not wearing hearing aids, maybe what we can do is that um, start off with five minutes or maybe two minutes, and then every hour the child should be wearing it for a certain number of minutes or hours, and then slowly and gradually expanding that number of hours, and the child will be able to use it constantly. Uh, okay, I would like to ask. Yes, you want to add something? Thank you, Zima. Do you ask a question? Why hearing aid and a cochlear implant is the option? Uh, unfortunately, in our part of the world, a lot depends upon uh, the finances available for uh, a cochlear implant in a very large segment of the people here. And in that case, it's always better to at least have the hearing aid given to the child rather than just wait without any amplification uh, because sometimes in my experience it has taken more than two years uh, for a child to be implanted uh, even though uh, he has been uh, uh, selected for implantation for, you know uh, at the right age so that's one of the reasons why and it should be given as early as possible as early as possible with the first year of life can okay, I, I would like add... to ask, uh, yeah, sure, sure, Miss Leah, sure. Sorry, no, I just like to add a bit now. Okay, you have to remember that, uh, okay, listening affects brain development, it's those developing your neural pathways. 
So at least providing hearing aids can make it, you can start stimulating. Okay. So the earlier the brain is stimulated, so the earlier those auditory pathways are being developed. Maybe not as good as cochlear implants, but you are providing some stimulation, which later on will help if the child will have access to cochlear implants. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Leah. Okay, so next and last question is, uh, I want to ask all of you for some useful take-home strategies that can be implemented with cochlear implant recipients. Ms. Amna, would you like to go first? Okay. Uh, what I usually uh, I, I give a list of various uh, uh, things that parents can do at home. But one thing here is when baby is really uh, less than a year old uh, or even a year and a half and has been implanted, very often the child is little enough to be carried. And uh, we label it items or things around the house is one practice which I suggest all parents must do. For the baby in your arms, point to things and label them. Ask the question, what is this, and label it. Uh, and this should be done as a practice uh, twice a day, once by each parent. So that gives the child a variety uh, of auditory input, uh, as well as uh, the child learns uh, the pragmatic function of uh, asking the question and answer and the parent is modeling to the child the names of various things around the house. Uh, receptive language also develops very, very well through this little activity. And uh, it's it's something which, which should be done with little children and can be done even with older children, but it's best, uh, the be results are best seen when the child is given an implant early. Uh, uh, yes, that is a year and a half to a year. Okay, Miss Leah, do you want to add something? Okay. Yes, I think for me there's uh, two things now. One is okay, you need to wear your device, whether it's a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. Parents need to think it's like a part of your body. You cannot live without it. So there's no compromise on that one. Okay. The next one is more for parents. Okay. For language to develop, children need to hear it. So I usually just tell to the parent, you need to talk and talk and talk and talk to your child. So it doesn't have to be like you're following the therapy in a clinic. Like in the morning, you have those routines, right? Use your words. Okay. And you can do it all throughout the day. With those constant repetition, the child will get access to, to language. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And Ms. Anam? I would want uh, to focus on generalization for sure, because a lot of times generalization is not happening. Uh, whatever is being done in the clinic remains in the clinic, and it is not carried over. Uh, and a lot of times uh, when we are working, because at, in clinic, we usually work on the closed set and the medium set. We are unable to work on the open set. Uh, open set is usually worked over uh, in a bigger environment with lots and lots of options, like unlimited options. So each and every skill that the clinician is teaching inside the uh, clinic setting should be carried over to the medium set and then the open set so that it is mastered fully. And it's not like that the child is just doing it in the closed set and not being able to do it open set, then it, there's no use of teaching the child that skill. So yes, this is very much important. And I see that there's a lot of times uh, this is not happening, which is why the child remains, you know, um, his, uh, his or her responses are limited to certain situations. The child is able to do it in the clinic setting, but not outside the clinic setting. So we need to work on that for sure. And Ms. Khatija? Well, I would add on to all of this because I agree with everything, especially with which Leah said about talk, talk, and talk. And I tell the parents that you literally have to do a commentary all day. So as much auditory bombardment there is, the child learns language. 
in a better way, better way and also everything through play also that, that everything should not be restricted to the therapy room like miss anna mentioned uh, flashcards and uh, just that only but i would suggest through play like i would also i even target action words through play you know having figures of animals and using a toy set a kitchen set and then just targeting them through play so the child does not feel burdenized that now this is the time to sit and learn only so it's learning is taking place and listening is taking place throughout the day okay so now as we are running out of time out of time and i have a lot of questions so thank you miss amna miss lia miss anam miss tabassum and miss khatija thank you so much for taking out your precious time and giving us this learning opportunity i hope you all had a great time stay safe stay healthy take care allah hafiz